Good evening and welcome everyone. My name is Marcela Guerrero, pronouns she, her, hers, and I'm an assistant curator at the Whitney Museum. Before I begin my opening remarks, I want to remind those who want to access closed captioning in English that they can do so by turning on this feature in the options bar below. Now I want to pass the virtual mic to our friends from Babilla Colectivo, who will be providing live interpretation in gender inclusive Spanish. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Cristobal. I am an interpreter for tonight along with my co-interpreter Pau. We are from a collective named Babilla. Hola a todos, mi nombre es Cristobal Guerra y voy a estar interpretando hoy con mi co-interprete Pau. Somos parte de un colectivo que se llama Colectivo Babilla. El evento de hoy va a ser en inglés y español. Tonight's event will be in English and Spanish con interpretación simultánea. We will provide simultaneous interpretation in both languages. Para poder accesar la interpretación, so you are in order to access the interpretation, you need to go to the bottom right corner of your Zoom screen. En la parte derecha abajo de su pantalla va a haber un icono de globo en donde puede seleccionar su idioma. On the bottom right corner of the screen, you will see an icon that says interpretation where you can select the language you want to listen to in. Una vez escoge el lenguaje, entonces va a escuchar a la interpretación simultánea al inglés o al español. Once you select which language channel you want to be in, you will be listening to the simultaneous interpretation either in English or in Spanish. Um, we ask that you speak at a moderate pace so that we can catch everything you say. Le pedimos que hable a un paso normal para poder capturar todo lo que dice. And if you have any trouble with the interpretation feature, you can message uh, Cristobal, myself, or Pau. We will be titled as interpreters on the Zoom screen. Si tienen algún problema con la interpretación, nos pueden mensajear a mí o a Pau a través del chat y le podemos ayudar. You can message us through the chat and we can help you with any issues you might have. Thank you very much and have a great event. Thank you, Dana Sturvers from Total Caption for the live captioning, and thank you, Cristobal and Pau, for providing interpretation in Spanish. Welcome again to the first of a trilogy of book presentations on the topic of Latinx arts and culture hosted by the Whitney. I am speaking to you today from the lands of the Canarsi and Monsi Lenape. I encourage everyone to take a moment to acknowledge the indigenous lands from where you're tuning in. I also come to you today with the firm belief that Black Lives Matter and in solidarity with the families and communities who have lost loved ones or have suffered as a consequence of police brutality and white supremacy. Likewise, it is not lost on me that the trauma of this pandemic is an ongoing one that still weighs heavily on many of us. Thank you for taking the time to be with us this evening. Tonight, I have the pleasure to introduce two great speakers whose work I've followed and admired for quite some time. Ed Morales is an author and journalist who has written for The Nation, The New York Times, The Washington Post, Rolling Stone, Jacobin, and The Guardian. He's also the author of several groundbra groundbreaking books, including Fantasy Island, Colonialism, Exploitation, and the Betrayal of Puerto Rico, Latinx, The New Force in Politics and Culture, Living in Spanglish, and The Latin Beat, From Rumba to Rock. If that wasn't enough, Morales is also a poet and a fiction writer. He was a recipient of a Jerome Fellowship in 1992 and was selected for the prestigious Repson Fellowship at Columbia University where he is a lecturer at the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race. He also teaches at CUNY's Graduate School of Journalism. We invited Ed tonight because his book, Latinx, tells a critical history about Latinx identity in the US. His intersectional analysis of the ways Latinx people constitute the largest minority group challenges American racial discourse. As he demonstrates, Latinx people are integral to the survival of this country while at the same time suffering from invisibility and misperceptions that are only heightened in times of crisis as we see playing out right now during this pandemic. Neither the descriptor of, an, of a monolithic group nor an exact fit in the racial binary that structures much of the discourse on identity in the US, Latinx stands to signify a refusal of colonial and neoliberal systems and the possibility of a future that centers our multiple histories in particular, our indigenous and black histories. We are grateful to Ed for his continued contributions to the field of Latinx studies and are thrilled that he's joining us today. In conversation with Ed is John Noriega, professor in the UCLA Department of Film, Television and Digital Media and the, and the director of the UCLA Chicano Studies Research Center. He is the author of Shot in America, Television, The State and the Rise of Chicano Cinema, an editor of numerous books and journals, including Aztlan, 
a journal of Chicano studies, which he edited from 1996 to 2016. Recently, he contributed an essay to the first monograph dedicated to the preeminent artist, Rafael Montañez Ortiz, whose work is currently on view as part of the Whitney's Making Knowing exhibition. In addition to his work in media and media policy, Noriega is a prolific curator. It would be impossible to give a full list here, but two important examples of his curatorial work are Home, So Different, So Appealing, which he co-curated with Mari Carmen Ramirez in 2017, and Phantom Sightings, Art After the Chicano Movement, co-curated co with Rita Gonzalez and Howard Fox in 2008. He's also editor of ABED, Revisioning Our History, an award-winning series from the Chicano Studies Research Center Press dedicated to individual Latinx artists. We wanted to put these two in conversation to consider, con consider the ways that Ed's book is essential reading for those of us who work in the arts and think about the politics of representation in visual and other aesthetic terms. Chon is a perfect interlocutor because he himself has also been a force in the art world. In the past, this force has been evident even at the Whitney where he has worked with next to, and let's say brushing against, um, brushing against it. And for this, I would like to take a minute to celebrate him. Whether it was as curator of the Willy Varela retrospective held at the Whitney in 1994, or as a curatorial advisor for the 1993 biennial, Chon left what for me, at least, is an indelible mark on the institutional history of the museum in relation to Latinx art. The letter he wrote to Elizabeth Sussman, lead curator of the 1993 biennial, is a master class in institutional critique. The lessons that young and older curators can glean from this letter as to how to narrate American art from a place of sincerity and true inclusivity are still relevant today. Before I turn the conversation to our two esteemed guests, I want to encourage everyone to submit their questions via the Q&A function. We have reserved time for Ed and Sean to take questions from the audience. And if you have technical difficulties, please let us know using the same box and our team will do their best to help you. Now I turn it on to Sean and Ed, thank you. Thank you so much, Marcela. And uh, I really appreciate the, the kind of kind words about uh, my almost 30 year relationship with the Whitney Museum. And Ed, it is truly an honor to be able to dialogue with you about your work in general, but about a book that I think really uh, should be required reading uh, for every college student, for every adult, um, not just because of the argument that you're making, but because of the challenge that it presents to really fundamentally rethink what America and American means uh, to the extent that it actually includes everyone who's here. And I wanna begin with a, a little bit of a love letter, if I can, uh, to just say that one of the pleasures of reading your work across a number of books and quite frequent uh, commentaries that you've done is that in reading you, I'm very conscious of engaging with a writer who is authoritative and yet whose authority is not based on a claim of higher knowledge or of the right answer but on being absolutely clear about where your feet touch the ground. And in terms of the writing itself, uh, it's not trenchant, it's not argumentative. You have an argument. Um, it's just, it's extremely notable for your insistence on calling things by their given name, rather than engage in the niceties of polite society uh, that have us not really be very clear and direct about what's happening. And just in terms of the, the book uh, Latinx, in terms of your most recent book, Fantasy Island, that is to just be clear about when white supremacy is white supremacy, when the political rule that we are in is authoritarian, uh, about the fact of anti-Black racism, uh, Islamophobia, and about calling a colony a colony. And I think in particular, going back many years, you have called celebrities, intellectuals to account for having access to the mainstream, for defending uh, and, and, and proclaiming to be in support of Puerto Rico and not saying the simple word, it is a colony of the United States. It is the oldest colony in the world at this point. Um, and then just the really wonderful 
equanimity of your critique. Um, and it makes room for everyone to be in the picture. It also uh, allows for the fact that everyone has a bit of dirty laundry, a bit of things that you have to really acknowledge and work through. So with that, I wanna to turn to a question about this book because it, it's a fascinating book. You can, you can get a sense of a number of, um, a number of things motivating it. Uh, from the, the last presidential election to the emergence of a, a new generation of politicized uh, Latin American descent youth in the United States. But I wanna start with the general framework because I'm, I'm perplexed about this. I am a member of the group as it were, <laughs> but we seem to be a group that has gone through so many name changes. Uh, I was born and told I was Mexican uh, and that was a good thing but be careful, not everybody agrees with you. Um, but there was also that phrase Spanish American that was being used and then uh, Hispanic, then Latino, then Latino A, Latina O, Latina O. And now we have Latinx, which is coming in as a, as a new uh, name. And I wanna just begin with a general question, why? Why are we a, a community such as we are um, that has trouble with a name. And then with Latinx, what is different about it? Why, why is it of this moment? And in what ways is it advancing things? In what ways is it uh, something that's very particular to a certain circumstance we're in right now? Well, uh, thanks for your uh, wonderful introduction. Um, I really appreciate that, uh, John, and um, I'm appreci appreciative that you uh, accepted my invitation to be my uh, interlocutor. Also want to thank uh, Marcella and Megan from uh, Whitney Museum for arranging this. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I mean, right now we're in a very uh, contested space in terms of uh, whether we want to be called uh, Latino or Latinx or, or group us all together in, uh, in one uh, way of uh, identifying ourselves. And I think that uh, relates to how uh, people of Latin American descent and really everyone, but maybe we're more acutely aware of it. I mean, we're both uh, a particular group and, uh, and a universal uh, attempting to form a universal identity at the same time. And, um, you know, there's also uh, an incredible diversity among uh, Latin American descended people that makes it uh, difficult to uh, function under one particular label. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the 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 tr you know the the coining of Hispanic and Latino. I mean, uh, as I teach a lot of my students, uh, these things happen. Um, from above, but then we also react to them uh, in our own attempts to define ourselves. So uh, there are certain aspects of Hispanic and Latino or uh, uh, that uh, can be tied to government efforts to group us together for political or economic reasons. But then there have been attempts by people of Latin American descent to uh, come together for uh, various reasons, for political power, uh, for class solidarity. Um, I recently did a review of a book about Hispanic Republicans and another group, uh, another book called The Latino Vote by Benjamin Francis Fallon, who talked about attempts in the 20s and 30s by uh, progressive uh, groups that were trying to organize workers who were reaching out to different Latin American descended workers around the country. If you look at the 1960s and 1970s, a lot of the groups that were forming around the civil rights movement um, looked to cohesive terms like uh, Latino to express uh, a goal of uh, demanding civil rights. Mm -hmm. So Latinx is something that um, really sort of came up. Uh, I noticed it among my students at Columbia um, in about five or six years ago, um, and they were explicitly talking about how it was tied to uh, an intervention against the gender binary. And I had been teaching um, this, an article by, uh, I believe it was a sociologist named Manolo Guzman, who talked about uh, homosexuality in, in Puerto Rico and how the, uh, 
the the definition of uh, homosexuality was uh, had many different roles and many different uh, uh, ideas about how you could occupy a spectrum of sexuality. And Guzman uh, theorized that this was somewhat parallel to um, the way that uh, Latinos also view race, which is uh, along uh, a spectrum um, and uh, against uh, binary. So I thought, well, this is very interesting because really most of the book is centered on um, ideas about race. And uh, I felt this is a, 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 an interesting way to show how um, there's something about um, Latin American descended cultures that uh, allows for this, uh, this view along a, a spectrum rather than uh, clinging to a binary. So um, Latinx, as I've said in, uh, when I've been quoted in articles, um, is a, it's, a, it's quite a, 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 a term because uh, it's the first time in my uh, recollection that an ethnic or racial group has decided, at least had an, a, a debate about um, labeling themselves to recognize non-binary people or queer people. And queer identity itself also has interesting parallels to uh, Latinx identity because uh, it, it sort of works against essentialism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's really an interesting point at the end because a, a, a dear friend, the, the late Jose Munoz, um, was trying to theorize uh, some of these same issues around the notion of brownness. Right. Which has its limits in, in terms of um, uh, implicitly, leave, you know, it's, it's stepping out of a black white binary, but it, it's, it's also not including the elements of that binary in, in a way. Um, but the way he's mobilizing that is very much within the framework of queer studies. Um, and that that kind of changes it. it. It makes it really function in a very uh, different way because it's all about a continual process of rejecting the binary, whether the binary is racial, uh, having to do with gender, having to do with uh, sexuality. Um, yeah, I, I feel a little I, odd about his use of brown in a way. I'm not really a big brown guy. Yeah, but uh, the idea of uh, just defining a group of people through difference, I think, is just kind of uh, revolutionary, rather than uh, trying to decide on uh, uh, some kind of shared essentialism, which uh, has been debated among uh, feminist circles, for instance. Um, the idea of holding a definition of a group of people as just a being different, like a being identified by difference is something that really appeals to me. Mm -hmm. It's a challenge though, because uh, you know my experience in the art world is um, the notion of uh, Latino art is best defined by its exclusion from museums. <laughs> right. Right. And, and so, and, and if the artist takes that up, they've essentially agreed with that exclusion that we are solely defined by the fact of not being within these institutions and these spaces, um, rather than the rejection of that definition and the binary that it establishes. And I, I see this tension in your work and it's, it's, I wonder how, if you can say something about how you navigate that, because as I mentioned, you, you, you really never put your thumb down on one, one side of an issue. You always acknowledge the complexity that's there. And yet you are trying to, in the way that Latinx is, move towards something better. Um, but the question for you is, um, a lot of times in that articulation uh, of rejecting a black white binary, the rejection of that is so much within the terms of that, that something like the indigenous drops out as a point of reference. And so then you turn to mestizaje, uh, which is its own kind of version of brownness, uh, which itself leaves out black and indigenous uh, or Asian or European, uh, which are pretty significant populations throughout the Americas. <laughs> right. Yeah. So how do you how do you navigate that? Because it's you're you're always in danger of kind of leaving something out, and then you have the difficulty of really trying to embrace the true complexity of uh, Latino and of American. Right. 
Well, um, you know, one of the things I talk about in the book is that uh, we don't have to be, uh, we have to be tied down by the idea of mestizaje that developed uh, in Latin America. You know, what I argue is that uh, the, the dynamic activity of uh, mixedness and hybridity um, has at times taken the opportunity to flip the script when it crosses the border. So in other words, the way that mestizaje excludes or is designed to exclude um, black and indigenous people from uh, Latin America um, be, can, has the potential of being altered in the United States precisely because of its interaction with the, with the black and white racial binary of the US, which what, it, what, what the black and right, white binary does for Latin American people is recenter uh, blackness and otherness and allows uh, Latin American descended people to more clearly recognize the black and indigenous aspects of themselves. And this is what happened, uh, I argue that in the 1960s and 1970s, the, uh, many of the, the groups that formed um, uh, through this political awareness that was created by the civil rights movement um, actively embrace African and indigenous identities. Now, I'm well aware that there's a lot of criticism. Um, I've, a lot of my students have brought uh, to my attention criticism of the essentialism that the Chicano movement was uh, guilty of in creating uh, sort of uh, essentialized versions of what indigenous was and maybe not respecting indigenous enough. Um, you could level similar criticism against um, groups in New York. I mean, in fact, uh, the, the uh, recent Jessica uh, Krug uh, controversy uh, kind of reflects a little bit of how the uh, blackness in Puerto Ricanness can become essentialized. But I see that as progress. I see that as a step forward. And in my book, I argue that Latinx is something or the collective Latino identity is something that we have the opportunity to center blackness and indigenous in that identity because simply giving it up or erasing it um, is giving up on the potential of enormous political and cultural power that we could have that actually black and indigenous groups do have because they don't get into particular debates about why should they all be together. Mm -hmm. It's interesting though, because that plays out very differently in, in different parts of the country. In, in California, where the black population and the indigenous population are very small, um, there's a great deal of skepticism about uh, Mexican and other Latin American uh, people in the state who have identifications with indigenous or with black culture. And particularly if you think of the Oaxacan community, which is larger than the entire uh, California native community. Uh, it, and it's a huge population that does not identify as Mexican, they identify as indigenous. And so you get into issues related to um, resources, essentially. And I, I wonder how that, how, how do you factor, how do you see that being negotiated? Your, your work's very clear about the issues related to uh, the forces of marketing uh, the celebrity kind of driven media that, that enhances that and the political machinations behind the race. But what about, um, what about from the position of being a self-identified BIPOC or Latinx, uh, you know, navigating that in mm. terms of the collectivity, that larger goal of redefining the whole? Yeah, I mean, I totally respect um, the objections of, uh, you know, groups mm -hmm. like uh, people from Oaxaca, people from Michoacan, um, all indigenous groups that don't necessarily even speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that uh, that negotiation is uh, an operative uh, principle. Uh, there, there may be a new way to, uh, that we might come to define uh, what we are, but um, the it's, we're never going to get anywhere unless we uh, 
work towards uh, recentering Black and Indigenous people. I think a big uh, uh, a big reason why there's so much pushback against the monolithic identity is because so much of it we left it to be defined uh, by marketers. You know, one of the things that I talk about in the chronology is you have this period of the 60s and 70s following the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And then with the sort of erosion and, and the implosion of a lot of those movements, there's this vacuum like there ha like happened in the rest of, the, of America. Reagan's America allowed for marketers and political consultants who did not want to take into account the kind of politics that came out of the 60s and 70s to center Latino-ness around whiteness, around an empty kind of consumer culture that celebrated patriarchal family and oppressed women. So uh, what we have to do uh, if we want to have a functional uh, Latinx uh, you know, uh, way of uh, grouping ourselves uh, politically and culturally is to understand that that happened and to readdress, you know, people uh, need to, uh, for, for instance, uh, acknowledge their white privilege. People who are uh, Latinos who, uh, what, I don't like to use the word white passing. A lot of people uh, use that word, uh, whether it's called passing or whether they actually are white. People need to acknowledge their, uh, their white privilege as, as a way to open up a space for groups that were previously excluded um, to, to become central uh, and driving forces behind whatever it is uh, that the, the Latino group uh, becomes. How much does this extend to things like language and also class, uh, the, the other forms of privilege in, a, in, in, a, in the US? Um, yeah. Well, you know, um, like being being bilingual um, is one way that we break down uh, th these ideas of uh, privilege based around language. You know, uh, Latin America that was the classic experience of uh, New Yorkans and Chicanos and other people who grew up in the United States as you go back to the home country and mm -hmm. people pick on you because you don't have a uh, perfect Spanish. So the the kind of the way that we are going to speak English and Spanish, whether it's we're going to use sp uh, Spanglish or we're not going to use uh, proper Spanish or we're going to use, uh, you know, urban um, uh, ways of uh, communi uh, communicating with each other in, in English. Um, mm -hmm. These are ways to break down this kind of uh, language privileges. I don't think that there should be a, a language po uh, policing you know, um, uh, either in English or Spanish. Um, I forget, what was the other thing that you asked me uh, in terms of- Oh, uh, class, yeah. uh, because class oh, yeah. very strongly at the end of the book yeah. Um, yeah. As, as really a factor, uh, yeah. more so I think than yeah. even the discussion in terms of gender and yeah. sexuality, which is mobilizing yeah. Latinx, yeah. you do pivot again towards an yeah. issue of class-based um, uh, yeah. identities, so. Well, sure. I think that there's a, you know, there's a lot of uh, dialogue among uh, people of color right now to sort of call out the uh, automatic worship of uh, those of us who uh, become uh, really economically successful and um, understand that we should have uh, class solidarity as long as most of us um, are uh, marginalized to uh, the lower end of the class structure mm -hmm. in the United States. And also, um, you know, one of the things that I, I like to talk about in the book is, and, and when I talk about uh, Latinx and where we are now is uh, being against the binary of, you know, you've either, you're either like into identity politics and you don't really critique um, class inequality or you're totally obsessed with uh, social class and, and class inequality is the only way to mobilize and, and, and sort of make uh, the appreciation of people of color, the appreciation of suffering of people of color as second, something secondary or not really political. Um, I think that, you know, the, the state that most of us are in as uh, Latinos or as people of color is that we are closer to working class uh, interests. So uh, the debate that, that came out after the uh, Trump uh, election uh, in which people blamed uh, the Democratic Party for uh, being too focused on identity politics and not recognizing enough 
white working class people. I, that's a false binary to me because people of color, you know, are working class people. We're probably more representative of working class people than white people are. So we should recognize that as people of color, we have, uh, it's in our interest to have strong ties to uh, working class people and to uh, promote uh, critiques of uh, inequality. As a teacher, do you have this experience in terms of, um, you know, like myself, many of my, my students are first generation um, and they're navigating the process of actually going through an inevitable change in class positioning to a sense of responsibility as well from where they come from and will always have come from. And so what I've noticed, you know, at UCLA, the, the Latino or Latinx students that are graduating have a much higher degree of, of civic mindedness of giving back to the community than other students. Uh, even though they're, they're acquiring the same benefits as any student that goes to a, a major university. Yeah. Um, so your question is, uh, well, are you noticing that how, as how well you... with your students? Um, with, um... Uh, well, yeah, I mean, this is a struggle. I mean, uh, I see students adjusting to be, you know, here's the thing, like I teach both at uh, Columbia, but I also teach at CUNY um, mm -hmm. as well as some semesters. And I have quite a, you know, a working class uh, composition of those students. So I really see the differences between um, people who uh, are going to elite uh, universities and people who are working, working and working poor people who are going to uh, uh, city and state funded universities. Um, the people who are in elite universities are, yeah, usually uh, a lot of times trying to adjust to being in a completely different uh, racial and, and class environment. And um, I think, uh, you know, I try to help people from the alienation that uh, they, they feel from that. But I do think that, yeah, there's a, uh, a tremendous amount of uh, responsibility that uh, students like that have. Um, and uh, I, I think that's your, your question. Yes, I, I see that quite a bit. Yeah. I, I want to ask you about something yeah. in the way that you're doing now as well. There's an attempt to really keep a lot of things on the table. Um, in, in terms of not framing the discussion in ways that uh, categorically exclude someone or um, become reductive about the nature of a, of a group. Um, and, uh, and, and you propose Latinx as, a, as one way in which uh, peoples of Latin American descent in the, in the US have as a way of really getting behind a project, the project of dismantling the racial binary of uh, shifting whiteness from the ultimate goal, the top of the, of the heap, to one among a number of positions and perspectives and experiences and identities. But in the process, in the book, you also, you, you kind of play with this, the concept of the collective black. And I wonder if you can say a little bit about that and, and how that sits alongside or in relationship to Latinx and to other things as well as a framing, as a, as a, as a way of really looking at society from in a different way. Yeah, well, I mean, that's one of the things about, um, one of the things I talked about in the book that um, maybe uh, uh, it's, it's not as uh, successfully resonating with what's going on now. Um, I, I originally, uh, took the idea of, I know I acknowledged it, from a, prof a professor of sociology named Eduardo Abonilla Silva, who's a black Puerto Rican. And he uh, had a thesis about how um, the US racial hierarchy was beginning to resemble more and more the Latin American racial hierarchy because um, in, in post-racial America, which was uh, signaled by the Obama election, there were certain characteristics about American uh, race discourse that were beginning to resemble for him uh, Latin Americans, which was that the idea of being post-race, being past the racial debate meant that we no longer needed to talk about race. In Latin America, people don't like to talk about race. And then he also saw the granting of honorary whiteness to an expanding uh, number of people 
Um, and that's another thing that we have in Latin America, which is one thing that a lot of people don't understand. Um, uh, Latin Americans uh, understand it when they migrate, which is that, you know, uh, un unless you have very strong phenotypic features that indicate that you're black and indigenous, in Latin America, you have this honorary whiteness. In other words, you're categorized as white, even if you're not exactly uh, European white. So. Um, the collective black is something that uh, Eduardo Bonilla Silva talked about, which was a group that would include um, the vast majority of people of color who are working class, um, but not just uh, African American or black people, also uh, dark skinned Asian people and dark skinned uh, Latino people. And so I saw it as a kind of a useful way for Latinos to declare their solidarity with uh, blackness. Um, uh, Bonilla Silva and other writers have pointed out that this label was used as in, uh, in England um, and it wasn't that successful because different groups began to see that they had different interests. And, uh, but I still, you know, uh, in the recent piece that I did about Latinos in London, I, I did uh, talk to a couple of people who grew up in Brixton, which used to be a heavily Jamaican neighborhood. And they were telling me that even though they were Colombian South American, they spoke English um, in the way that uh, the Jamaican uh, uh, style uh, established. Um, but the problem with collective black is that right now there's a very strong um, feeling that I'm sensing that uh, black people want to define their identity in a way that uh, avoids those who are maybe only partially black from uh, you know, really uh, 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 defining themselves as black. And this is one of the reasons why um, Jessica Krug was successful was because there's this idea that if you're Puerto Rican or if you're uh, sort of mixed race appearing Latino, you can claim blackness. And I think that there you can see uh, the flaw of, uh, of people who uh, aren't strongly phenotypically black like claiming blackness. So, you know, I would maybe uh, feel that that uh, collective black, I, I still think it's a nice ideal. I do think that, you know, uh, things are, are different. You know, uh, years ago, like when I was at the Village Voice, a lot of African-American writers would say, hey, man, you, you know, you're black, man. And then I would say, yeah, of course. And, and there was this more, there's this idea of, yes, um, you know, we're, we're identifying this, I'm not denying blackness, you know, but now there's a strong feeling of this is potentially harmful to the black community. And so I respect that. Hmm. It, I'm trying to figure out how to um, kind of navigate this because it, it's such a complex issue and the Jessica Krug thing which you've written about it, you, you posted a, a, an article on Monday about this and, and, and address some of these issues. Um, she's passing for black by passing for Puerto Rican. Yeah, uh, exactly. And that's but I mean, I'm very, double, yeah. double mimicry. It's, it's just yeah. like, it's, it's, it's hard to get your head around because we're so, yeah. the discussion of, of black and white is actually, you know, as you say, the hypo descent, it's the one drop rule, it, right. but one drop, is strictly a discussion between what is identified as white and what's identified as black. Yeah. And I'm very proud of the way that uh, Puerto Ricans identify uh, with blackness, whether it's seen as flawed or not. Mm -hmm. And I see a real sincerity um, and, and acceptance. You know, uh, we, we share so many experiences in New York and in Puerto Rico. But at, at the same time, you know, we have to recognize that uh, particularly in Puerto Rico, there's a really strong streak of racism uh, against uh, uh, black people. And uh, again, it's just a matter of uh, speaking frankly about these things and, uh, you know, making alliances and, and opening, opening up space for black Puerto Ricans and black Latinx people to express themselves. I mean, what are your thoughts about the, the fact that there's almost a fourth of Latinos identify as black, but they, they are placed within the margins of the category of Latino 
and they're separate from the category of, of black. It, it, it seems like there's, there's, a, there's a contradiction or a paradox there in terms of, of making a group invisible that actually strengthens uh, the broader argument for racial diversity, racial equality. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, the Afro-Latinx uh, identity is uh, it's an intersectional problem. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a double oppression. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there are ways that uh, uh, Afro-Latinx people navigate uh, the African-American world uh, very easily. Um, and then there, there are times there's, there's friction. So uh, that I think is, it's an argument for exactly what I'm saying, which is um, moving away towards essentialized notions of identity and recognizing uh, multi-positionality in people as long as they are showing respect and solidarity with people of color. I, I think that, you know, one of the big takeaways from the book, particularly for non-Latino uh, would be to really foreground the fact that the U.S. perspective on race is very much an American thing. It, it, it's an American construct that's in, in ignorance of the rest of the world and how it functions. And you identify what comes out of Latin America not as the solution, not as a better model, but as something that once it comes into the U.S. context, the, the two framework can help dismantle each other in a way uh, by bringing them in. And that's, I think, at the heart of what you're proposing with, uh, with kind of the, this providing this early um, kind of a historically framed account of Latinx. Um, I'm, you know, I'm writing about a, a Puerto Rican artist in the U.S. Um, that Marcela mentioned, uh, I think earlier, uh, uh, Rafael Ortiz. And I was looking at the census from the 19th century of his family in Vieques. And the census would record uh, Negro, Blanco, Mulato. It was a you know, black, white, uh, mixture of black, white. And um, most, most of the population was Mulato. And when the Americans took over and they took over the census project, as it were, um, by 1916, uh, by the 1920 uh, census, the, the Puerto Rican population had realized that um, the Americans have a thing with blackness. So everybody was suddenly white. <laughs> right? And so you have this shift in frameworks, but not a shift in people, and not a, a shift in, in the ways they interact and, and the understandings of, of who they are and family and language and all of that. Uh, but it really just shows how different the US framework is uh, from other models in other parts of the world, including the, the rest of the Americas. Yeah. Well, uh, what I found is that uh, the black white binary uh, is strongest when there is more, most motivation for economic gain to be extracted from racial difference. So for instance, a place like Cuba um, had a much stronger black white binary uh, precisely because it was the site of um, the sugar uh, production and uh, importation of slaves. Yeah. So in other countries that um, had uh, less of this uh, economic uh, uh, motivation, um, uh, a broader hierarchy of race was established. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I wonder about one thing in this book, which is um, there's really a strong case made for um, the possibilities of large urban areas. Uh, and in a sense, you're, you're kind of, you're writing a manifesto about um, what can be different within cities as opposed to towns or rural areas. Do you have anything you want to add about that uh, in terms of? Um... Well, yeah, I mean, I, I see, you know, uh, the, the, it's, I think it's chapter nine where I talk about um, 
uh, urban areas are where uh, Latinx people um, are uh, embracing a racial difference um, more effectively and in a more widespread fashion. Um, and I mean, I think that we can see that uh, one of the celebrated ways that, for instance, uh, Puerto Ricans uh, uh, found Black identity was uh, living in close proximity with African Americans in a place like uh, New York. And I think that LA has a sort of parallel situation, even though it's not exactly the same way. I think that Chicano identity has really been informed by African American identity uh, by being in close, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, by being close uh, in, in, uh, in an urban situation with, uh, with African Americans. So, um, I think that right now, I mean, I wrote the chapter like in uh, 2017 or so, and I think that the way we see the evolution of Black Lives Matter protests, you see uh, that sort of a collective nature of a multiracial group of people who, by virtue of uh, sharing this urban experience, um, connect a lot of different political issues about social class, about the environment, about uh, police, uh, brutality, and they, they're they already create, creating a, an effective uh, functioning uh, political force. And that's kind of what I, I meant um, about uh, Latinx opportunity to uh, solidify this sort of identity that I'm speaking about, which is a Latinx identity um, that centers uh, Black and Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. um, it has uh, a, a much more opportunity to uh, evolve in that way um, in an urban setting. And I think the other dimension as well is generational. You know, we often talk about the demographic shifts taking place and where they're taking us. We're already there if you look at youth. And that is where Latinx is primarily emerging out of and being defined. Uh, only 3% of Latinos identify with that term, only 24% have heard of it. And yet it has really acquired great purchase, great impact, uh, because I think it defines a, ch a change, a categorical change in the relations among young folks who are growing up in, in, in a world in which it, the non-white population is the majority population there in terms of, particularly in, in, in large cities. I see we have Marcella back on, and I think this is time for her to actually uh, pose some of the questions we've been getting. We maybe touched upon one or two, but uh, there's been some great uh, questions that have come in during the talk. Yes, and I encourage you. I can't see any of them. No, don't <laughs> worry about that. <laughs> but also I wanted to remind people that they can continue to submit questions. We'll try to get to a couple of them. Um, and yes, as Chun said, you've already covered a couple of the ones that um, have been coming in. I actually have a question and I'm gonna be kind of selfish here and ask um, because another you know, term that has evolved um, as much as Latino, Latina, Latinx, Hispanic is the term mestizaje. It has its own history, which you cover very thoroughly in your book. Um, and with the uprisings, um, you know, after the George Floyd murder and the Black Lives Matter uh, protest, I, I, you know, just from social media and, and other sources, I've started to notice how the term um, is seen in a very particular way. Um, and I understand the impulse of saying, you know, mestizaje is uh, silencing Black voices. I, I understand that impulse. But at the same time, and I think what you're doing in the book is um, talking about a type of mestizaje that is a way of um, not wanting to side with the Anglo-white identity, you know, as a way to refuse that. And, you know, I'm just reminded of a, a quote of Fred Moen, um, where he said uh, very cleverly, I have written this out, um, I want to work with anybody, anybody who's willing to make a concerted effort to not be effing white. I'm trying. You know, say, <laughs> in, 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 in that very poetic way, just like saying, you know, I'm not talking about literal whiteness, but that other type of whiteness. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I, I wanted you to say if you could briefly a couple of words and, or something about that evolution of the term mestizaje. 
Well, you know, I, I don't even know if we need to even use it anymore. It's useful to use it to identify what happened in Latin America as a way to maybe understand how it can manifest. Uh, the, and, you know, I would say the Messi Zaya really stands for the potential of uh, mixed race identity for multi-positional identity. Um, and uh, the project of Messi Zaya in Latin America was designed to uh, foster whiteness, to keep white people in control, to encourage uh, darker people to marry lighter skinned uh, uh, mates so that uh, they could eventually achieve the sort of uh, off-white uh, Latin American whiteness, which is maybe slightly darker than Anglo whiteness. So uh, maybe we just need to come up with a new term so that people don't really uh, associate the negativity of uh, what happened with Mesti Zahe um, to what the project could involve um, in the United States. Great. I have a question here that um, I'll, I'll read it from Elvis Diaz. Thoughts on how can political campaigns develop positive relationships with the various identities of Latino groups when addressing them? And I'll just interject to say that I thought this question was interesting because you also talk about how young, um, you know, the, the large percent of a young Latinos or young Latinx people and how that is different, very different from perhaps a couple of generations ago where it was mostly Mexican, Puerto Rican, Cubans. And now we're seeing different groups and ostensibly these are people who are voting for the first time. So I kind of wanted to pair these two of how you see this in relationship to uh, voting. Um. You know, I think that uh, one thing that I always say is that uh, people of Latin American descent, uh, there's no reason why you can't be constantly uh, reinforcing and working on who you are as the person that comes or has ancestry from uh, one specific country. It's beautiful and necessary for us to all focus on our Mexicanness, our Colombianness, our Puerto Ricanness, our Dominicanness. Um, but that doesn't need to exclude um, trying to come together as a larger group. Um, you know, the problem with politics uh, right now is that uh, there's the, the issues that uh, are being used to organize Latinos um, have been largely ineffective and tone deaf. I think that the strong vote for Bernie Sanders in the Southwest indicated the possibility of a Latino politics where people are talking about uh, climate change, they're talking about uh, universal health care, um, you know, social justice, uh, uh, mass incarceration, end of police brutality. Um, and I think those are issues that uh, should define Latinx, but at the same time shouldn't be exclusive to Latinx and a way for us to uh, make coalitions with other marginalized groups. Thank you. Um, okay, Chun, I know you're seeing the question, so if you see one that um, intrigues you, go ahead and ask. Um, there's one from Isabella Parlamis. It's a little bit long, but I'll, I'll read everything. Um, she says, hi, thank you for a wonderful and thought-provoking discussion. I've been thinking of the writing of Laura Pulido about third world left, leftist, leftist movements and the ways in which differential racializ re racialization leads to distinct forms of radical politics across Black, Latinx, and Japanese American groups. As I understand her, she sees multiracial activism as a hindrance to the advancement of rights for specific groups. How do you find her writing and what would you say about the power and or problems of multiracial activism, especially in regards to the Latinx community, which is inherently multiracial? Uh, yeah, uh, did Chan, you wanna, I'm sorry, Chan? I'll go ahead if you, yeah. Um, yeah. Have I, I mean, been monopolizing all the answers? I'm sorry. No, well, this is, this is about you, man. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I I, I don't quite see Laura's work in, in that way, uh, but I think that um, it's very much about the particular moment in which coalitions come together, whether it's across race uh, or class or what have you. Um, 
that are typically for very specific goals. Um, and, and they tend to kind of cease at that moment as well. Uh, and it's the nature of any coalition they're, they're, and, and social movements, they are hard to sustain uh, you know, beyond uh, the immediate issues or concerns that give rise to them and that political uh, moment. That said, and this is where I can turn it back to, to Ed, I, I think there are values of the kind of corrective that he's offering in terms of thinking more dynamically about any uh, group, let alone its relationship to other groups. So. Yeah, I mean, I would just say that um, I think that there is a very valid point that she makes, and I understand that um, she's making that point. Mm -hmm. um, I just prefer to look at it uh, in terms of, uh, you know, how we are progressing through history. Um, these kinds of coalitions have had a lot of difficulty because there hasn't been enough dialogue about how we address uh, different groups and different groups are not as uh, aware of each other's needs but i'm seeing more and more uh that sort of happening sort of a generalized discourse about multiple groups and their needs and uh perhaps we should look to the future for um uh, you know, a, a, a better uh, carrying out of that uh, idea. Thanks. Um, okay, this next question is more specific to art. Um, so again, if Chun wants to chime in, um, this is Elena Kettleson Gonzalez asking, thank you both uh, so much for your incredibly important work as a Latina curator working both within institutions and in independent projects. I feel so much tension between spaces by us, for us, and those where we enter through invitations. In spaces for us, we understand our collective difference and the political utility and joy of the term Latinx. When entering white supremacist institutions, we again become erased, homogenized, misunderstood, and tokenized. Do you have thoughts as to what, to what work do white folks working in the arts need to do concretely to invest in Latinx art in a way that moves away from this essentializing and from the history of class elitism of the Latin American art market? I, I think that's a very uh, astute kind of framing of the issue. Um, I think it's important to understand that the community-based or the Latino-run units are as complex uh, as the mainstream ones that exclude them. Um, and that any institution, any organization poses challenges in terms of you know, actively expanding the framework of what it, it, it looks at and what it explores. The, the problem I think we have in terms of arts institutions in the US for Latinx uh, artists and curators is that there is almost no understanding of the population period. Um, and so that really creates a, a lot of insanity basically as you try to uh, advance a project within it. It involves an incredible amount of negotiations at almost every level um, because there isn't an understanding of the Latino population as a, an audience, um, as a part of the environment that the institution serves, and as having a history um, that they have not learned in school. Um, the, it's not a public part of our culture. And what Ed is pointing out, the, the Latino population is for all intents and purposes invisible, either as a cultural phenomenon uh, or as a, a, a population that skews very heavily towards essential workers. But it's a very important voting block and market uh, for society. And so it's depended upon. We watch more TV, we go to more movies, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and it's taken for granted, uh, or it's, it's it, what is known about it is done behind the scenes rather than saying, let's really advance the collective understanding of this group. And we saw that in terms of even, uh, you know, the, the advertising rates for TV are based on Nielsen, but Nielsen never considered Spanish language TV to be the same as English language TV, even though in Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, 
these are sometimes the most uh, popular, most viewed uh, stations. Um, so this is a continual issue. I don't think the solution is to retreat into our own institutions. It's to insist on uh, really being able to participate fully in both uh, and to have the full range of possibilities. And, um, you know, I know this from my own experience, but I also see it with the younger generation of curators like Marcela and others who are getting into uh, some of the larger uh, kind of mainstream institutions at, at the municipal level or of, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of the kind of A-list museums, uh, that there's a lot of work to be done there. And I think that it's good to throw the challenge back at the institution itself, but it's also important to say uh, the, the, the makeup of the workforce of that institution needs to change from the top down. Um, not just the public face, which are guards and, and uh, the, the people taking your tickets and uh, the janitorial, uh, but all the way up to the curatorial ranks where the programs get made uh, and what you see on the wall and who it reflects is decided upon. And that, that is not uh, an issue of, of morality or ethics or of individual responsibility. It's quite simple, equal opportunity to work within societal institutions. And I think that has to be pushed for. Uh, not that the other thing that, that is being brought up isn't important and doesn't need to be on the front line of, uh, of a set of, of holding institutions accountable, but we also just need to change. Them. So. Okay. Thank you, Chum, that was great. Um, Marcela, you wanna say something? Four or one, depending oh, on. Five or five or one. <laughs> <laughs> we have somebody from Australia here, and they could tell us it's a very different. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ed, uh, do you want to, you know, have some parting words? I have some concluding uh, uh, thoughts, but I wanted to make sure that you know you have the last word. Yeah. Well, you know uh, the. Latinx, you know, I, I gave the book the title because I, I had heard really about the use of this label, but I also meant it to mean uh, the, that Latinx wa, uh, showed how uh, Latinos are the X factor in the race debate and also that uh, X can also mark uh, both the visibility and invisibility um, and that sort of binary about the, the threat and, uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the passive consumer. Um, so I am, uh, I'm, you know, I feel that uh, our story is really difficult to tell. It's going to take a long time to really tell it. And I think that's uh, a big reason why there is this invisibility that people talk about and difficulty of navigating through it. Um, but I, I think it represents um, a beautiful journey in uh, the time that it takes to work through it and finally uh, manifest uh, the idea. Well, thank you, Ed and Chun. This was a great and very stimulating conversation. Um, so before we conclude uh, this evening, I would like to thank Megan Hewer, Director of Public Programs at the Whitney for making this all possible. Uh, tonight's discussion is the first of three events at the Whitney dedicated to new scholarship on Latinx art and culture. Our second presentation will be on Thursday, October 1st with Arlene Davila, uh, who will be in conversation with Adriana Zavala, talking about Davila's new book, Latinx Art, Artists, Markets, and Politics. I'm also excited to announce that our third book presentation will be on the occasion of Elizabeth Ferrer's upcoming publication, Latinx Photography in the United States. Uh, the dates for the third event are still to be determined, but we'll make sure that everyone receives the announcement once we make them public. And finally, thanks to Andy Hawks, Daima Siemens, and Sofia Silva for being thoughtful partners in the way we bring these events to a wide range of audiences. Thank you, everyone, and um, good night. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>